ان الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور انفسنا وسيئات اعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له واشهد ان لا اله الا الله وحده لا شريك له واشهد ان محمدا عبده ورسوله يا ايها الذين امنوا اتقوا الله حق تقاته ولا تموتن الا وانتم مسلمون يا ايها الناس اتقوا ربكم الذي خلقكم من نفس واحده وخلق منها زوجها وبث منهما رجالا كثيرا ونساء واتقوا الله الذي تساءلون به والارham ان الله كان عليكم رقيبا يا ايها الذين امنوا اتقوا الله وقولوا قولا سديدا يصلح لكم اعمالكم ويغفر لكم ذنوبكم ومن يطع الله ورسوله فقد فاز فوزا عظيما اما بعد فان اصدق الحديث كتاب الله وخير الهدي هدي محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم وشر الامور محدثاتها وكل محدثه بدعه وكل بدعه ضلاله وكل ضلاله في النار اما بعد Brothers and sisters in Islam, the Islamic community was considered the epicenter of spiritual prosperity and the citadel of social opulence for the believers during the life of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. The Islamic community, as a concept of spiritual fortitude, never loses its relevance, irrespective of time, place, and circumstance. Thus, it is becoming increasingly significant today where many Muslims seem to be losing their children, their lives, their souls, and even their minds to this dunya and its zina, to the life of this world and its glitter, pomp, and its glamour. The paradigm shift such as this usually occurs in environments where there's a strong sense of moral and spiritual unrest and obscurity. This is especially true when many of our young ones are frequently exposed to a vast array of trials and tribulations that begin to impact their Islamic identity as well as their allegiance to the religion of Al-Islam. On the authority of Abu Huraira رضي الله تعالى عنه قال قال رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم بادروا بالأعمال فتنا كقطع الليل المظلم يصبح الرجل مؤمنا ويمسي كافرا أو يمسي مؤمنا ويصبح كافرا يبيع دينه بعرض من الدنيا The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said بادروا بالأعمال hasten to do good deeds meaning take advantage of the time that you have right now to do good deeds before we are confronted with a time that will be so trying, so difficult and the obscurity will be so severe that a man will wake up a believer and go to sleep a disbeliever he will wake up in the morning believing in God and go to sleep at night disbelieving in God. Or vice versa. He will go to sleep a believer and wake up a disbeliever. A man will sell his religion for a portion of this dunya. Imam al-Nawwi rahimahullah ta'ala in his commentary on this hadith, he said that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam here is describing a type of spiritual dilemma caused by fitan caused by trials and tribulations that will make an individual wake up a believer and go to sleep a disbeliever or vice versa. And this is due to the magnitude of the fitna which causes a man to flip flop in one day with this level of indecision. Switching or transitioning from one belief to another is something that people don't normally do. So for a person in these times to say I believe in God in one minute and then the next minute turn around and say I don't believe in God then this is shows you the magnitude of the trials and tribulations that those people are living in during those times. And in our communities, brothers and sisters, our communities should not be a source of fitna. Our communities should not be a source of fitna. Our communities should be a fortress by which we are protected from fitna. Which fitna literally strips people of their zeal their desire to want to be religious because of the impact of the trials and tribulations they are confronted with. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, وَأَطِيعُوا اللَّهَ وَرَسُولَهُ وَلَا تَنَازَعُوا 
ولا تنازعوا فتفشلوا وتذهب ريحكم واصبروا واصبروا إن الله مع الصابرين الله سبحانه وتعالى said and obey Allah and obey his messenger ولا تنازعوا and don't fall into arguments amongst yourselves فتفشلوا and then you become separated amongst each other وتذهب ريحكم and your strength depart from you you lose strength this is what happens when argumentation, constant argumentation and debating over trivial issues regarding the religion. This is what it does to us. It causes us to split, not just physically in our bodies, but to split in our hearts. We begin to literally hate one another because of trivial matters in the deen, some of which scholars have differed over these issues generation after generation. And we come today and we follow in the same trend of allowing these issues to disrupt the unity and the brotherhood that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala blessed us and favored us with. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, وَاسْفِرُوا in اللَّهَ مَعَ الصَّابِرِينَ Be patient with one another. Indeed, Allah is with those who are patient. Abdullah bin Mas'ul رضي الله تعالى عنه He said, مَا تَقْرَهُونَ فِي الْاجْتِمَاعِ خَيْرٌ مِمَّا تَقْرَهُونَ فِي الْفُرْقَةِ خير مما تحبون في الفرقة. عبد الله بن مسعود رضي الله تعالى عنه. He said that which you hate united is better than what you love separated. It's better than what you love separated. Meaning that although we are separated and we enjoy our individualism, it is better for us to be united and dislike the unity that is amongst us. It's better for us to do that than to separate it and be individuals. Imam Bukhari rahimahullah ta'ala mentioned in his sahih on the authority of Abdullah ibn Mas'ud radiallahu ta'ala anhu who when he found out that Uthman ibn Affan he used to pray with the believers at Mina during the time of Hajj during the time when Uthman was a Khalifa he would pray with the believers on Mina during the time of Hajj and he would pray Salatul Dhuhr and Asr four raka'ah and it was from the Sunnah of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam to pray Dhuhr and Asr two raka'ah on Mina during the Hajj time so some of the students of Abdullah bin Mas'ud radiallahu ta'ala who came to him and they said, أَلَا أَخْبَرَتْنَا أَنَّ النَّبِيَ صَلَى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَّمْ كَانَ يُصَلِّ رَكَعَتَيْنِ فِي الْمِينَ وَأَبُوْ بَكَرْ وَكَذَانِكَ عُمَرْ فَقَالَ Abdullah bin Mas'ud بَلَى وَأَقُولُ لَكُمْ الْآنِ لَكِنْ عُثْمَانْ عَمِرُ مُؤْمِنِينَ وَكَرِهْتُ أَنْ أُخَالِفَهُ فَإِنَّ الْإِخْتِلَافِ شَرْ وفي رواية قال اختلاف شر كله. They said to Abdullah bin Mas'ud, didn't you tell us that the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam used to pray two rakaa, two units of prayer on Mina, and so did Abu Bakr and so did Umar. Abdullah bin Mas'ud, he said yes, and I'm telling you the same thing right now. He said, but with man is the leader of the believers. هو أمير المؤمنين. He is the leader of the believers. What كريه تو إن مخالفه. And I hate it to oppose him. In such a trivial issue in the deen. I don't have to make it, you know, my business to, you know, say that this is the sunnah and expose him in front of everybody. He is, this is respect for leadership, which we don't have today. The imam says something that somebody dislikes or they know a different opinion. In the middle of Jumu'ah, you'll stand up and oppose the imam because you have no respect. You have no respect for leadership. And this is one of the, you know, missing pieces to the puzzle that is, you know, the main cause of the, the, the trials and tribulations that we experience today as an ummah. Because we have no respect for leadership. We don't know how to respectfully disagree. When a Muslim disagrees with another Muslim, you will find some of the most amazing things coming out of his mouth and from his behavior simply because you don't agree with him. But he said that I hated to oppose with man, with man Amir al-Mu'mineen. He is the leader of the Muslims. He said, but ikhtilaf shar, and differing is evil. Differing is evil. Unless we understand the importance of this, we understand that fitna doesn't just affect the people that's involved. It has a, a ripple effect on everybody else. Listen to what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran. وَاتَّقُوا فِتْنَةً لَا تُصِيبَنَّ الَّذِينَ ظَلَمُوا مِنْكُمْ خَاصًا وَاعْلَمُوا أَنَّ اللَّهَ شَدْ 
God said, and fear of fitna that will not just affect those that are directly involved or the wrongdoers from amongst you. Fitna affects everybody. Trials and tribulations, discord, it affects everybody, not just the people that are immediately involved. And once we understand the importance of this, we do our best to keep these things or these negative uh, issues or elements away from the community and we begin to work on the internal structure of the community. There was a couple of components, a number of components that the Prophet Sallallahu used to build his community. The first of those components was ikhlas, sincerity to Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala. Consolidating, consolidating our agenda. The agenda is not personal, it's not about me, it's not about you, it's not about the Imam, it's not about the board, it's not about this one or this one, it's about Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala and cooperating with one another for that particular agenda, consolidating the agenda. As Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions in the Quran, لَمَسْجِدٌ مُسِّسَ عَلَى تَقْوَى مِنْ أَوَّلِ يَوْمٍ أَحَقُّ أَمْ تَقُومَ فِيهِمْ فِيهِ رِجَالٌ يُحِبُّونَ أَنْ يَتَطَهَّرُوا وَاللَّهُ يُحِبُّ الْمُطَّهِرِينَ and the masjid whose foundation was built from the very beginning, from the first day upon taqwa, yani ikhlas lillahi subhanahu wa ta'ala. The masjid that was built from the first day upon sincerity to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, it has more right that you stand in it. In it are men who love to purify themselves, and Allah loves those who love to purify themselves. How is it that our Lord is one? Ilahukum ilahum wahid. Your Lord is one. Our Qibla, our direction that we face is one. We stand for the prayer. There's no two times for Salatul Bur. The Bur is only one time. Asr is only one time. Maghrib is only one time. There's only one time for Salatul Fajr. There's no two Fajrs. Everything in our deen is one with the exception of the heart of the believers. La ilaha illallah. Everything is one. The direction that we pray is one. The times for the Salat is one. The, our Lord that we worship is one. We don't worship more than one God because then that would, that would mean that the agenda would be more than one. As Yusuf السلام, he said to his companions in the prison, he said, Ya sahibi sijin, a'arbaabun mutafarrikun, khayru amillahi wahid al Oh my companion of the prison, is one God easier to worship or is it many gods? You got a God, you know, that you supplicate for, you know, to, for your wife to get pregnant. You have a God that you supplicate for, for risk, for provision. You have a God that you supplicate for good health. They had 360 idols around the Kaaba. Each idol had a particular merit or value with it that they would go to to supplicate for. Is it easier to just go to one God and supplicate to one God, or is it easier to go to many gods? When you consolidate the agenda, it makes, it brings about simplicity. It's not about me, it's not about you, it's about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And so this was the concentration of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam when he built his community. It wasn't about him, it wasn't about anyone in particular, it was always about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. There was another component that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam used in building his community and that was the establishment of the masjid. The masjid was seen as the hub of Islamic education and also paved the way for the social and religious life of the Muslims. It was a place that was designed specifically for three things, and that was the salah, the remembrance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and the recitation of Quran. When the Bedouin Arab he entered into the masjid, دخل أعرابي في المسجد وبال في ناحية المسجد فقال النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم إن هذه المساجد لم تبنى لهذا وفي رواية قال لم تبنى لقبر ولا بور إنما بني هذه المساجد إنما بنيت لذكر الله وقراءة القرآن والصلاة that a Bedouin Arab he entered into the masjid and he urinated in a corner of the masjid the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam called him close to him and he said, these places of worship have not been built for that, for that purpose. They were built for the remembrance of Allah, for the establishment of the Salah and the recitation of Quran. That was the foundation upon which the masjid was built. However, the masjid had other important roles to play in the community. It was home to some of the companions who did not have a place to live, many of whom were memorizers of the Quran, 
like Mudayf ibn Yaman, like Abdullah ibn Mas'ud, and Abu Huraira They were all part of a group of the believers that were called Ahlul Safa. Ahlul Safa, they were poor and indigent Muslims who came to Medina, migrated from other places to Medina, like Abu Huraira who came from Yemen, like Salman al Farsi who came from Persia. They came from other places to Medina to live with the Prophet وسلم, but did not have a home. And so the masjid became their home. They lived on the back porch of the masjid when the Muslims used to, uh, to pray facing Beit al Maqdis, facing Jerusalem. When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala changed the direction of the Qibla from Beit al Maqdis to the Kaaba in Mecca, the back area of the masjid, it was empty. And that back area of the masjid became the porch that they used to live in. They used to spend the night there, they would sleep there, they would live there. As Abu Huraira he mentioned in an authentic narration where he said that there were over 400 companions of the Prophet who were part of Ahlul Sufa. Poor and indigent who lived in the masjid. قال أبو هريرة رضي الله عنه لقد رأيت سبعين من أهل الصفة ما منهم رجل عليه رداء إما رداء وإما كساء وقد رأيت معي في الصفة أكثر من ثلاثمية أصحاب ثم رأيت بعد ذلك كل واحد منهم أميرا أو وزيرا لدعاء النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم لهم Abu Hurair radiallahu anhu, he said that I saw at least 70 of the people who were poor and indigent living in the masjid. Some of them didn't even have shirts to wear. They didn't have a shirt and a pants. Some of them even had a shirt or a pair of pants. They didn't have both. They didn't even have clothes to wear. He said, and I saw at least 300, over 300 of them living with me on the back porch of the masjid. And I saw approximately nine years later, that each and every one of them either became a governor, an emir, a governor or a leader over some particular area because of the dua that the Prophet sallallahu made for them. The masjid was also a place of Islamic knowledge where the believers would go and satisfy their spiritual appetite starting with the Prophet sallallahu who would review the Quran, the whole Quran with Jibreel alayhi salam in the masjid every year. On, the, on one occasion, Angel Jibreel, he came down in the form of Dihya al-Kalbi, one of the companions of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa And he began to ask the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam questions. He asked them, what is Islam? What is Iman? What is faith? What is Ihsan? What is excellency in the deen? And the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam answered those questions. At the end of the hadith, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam turned to Umar and said, Ya Umar, atadini man is sa'id. Umar, do you know who the questioner was? Umar said, Allah and his messenger knows best. The Prophet sallallahu said that to Jibreel. Atakum yu'allimukum umura deenikum. That was Jibreel. He came to teach you your deen. They began to learn their deen in the masjid. Today we don't learn our deen in the masjid. We learn our deen through text messages and through Facebook. This is the way that we're learning our religion. We don't come and sit in the masjid with qualified people of knowledge and learn our deen. We accept any text message that comes to us that says, oh, you should do this or you should do that. I got a text message today. Does that make it okay? Does that, make it, does that validate the, the, the comment that you read because it was a text message? We almost sound like people who used to say back in the day that, you know, it's the truth because I saw it on the news. It's the truth because I saw it on the news. Now it's the truth because I read it on Facebook or I read it on someone's blog or someone sent it to me in a text message. This is the way that we're learning our deen today. Abu Huraira radiallahu anhu, after the death of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he went to the aswaq, he went to the marketplace, and he began to yell in a loud voice in the marketplace, Antum hauna wa mirat al nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam tuza' fil masjid. He came to the marketplace and he said, Why are you all here in the marketplace when the inheritance of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is being distributed in the masjid? So they left there, they closed up their shops. They went to the masjid, and all they saw in the masjid was hilaq al-ilm. They saw circles of knowledge. This group of people sitting with this scholar. This group of people sitting with this this scholar. They turned to Abu Huraira, and they said, You said that the mirah, that the inheritance of the Prophet ﷺ was being distributed in the masjid. We don't see anything but circles of people learning their religion. Abu Huraira he said, ذَاكَ مِرَاطِ النَّبُوَةِ فَإِنَّ الْأَنْبِيَاءَ أَنْبِيَاءَ لَا يُوَرِّثُونَ دِنَارًا وَلَا دِرْهَمْ إِنَّمَا يُوَرِّثُونَ الْعِلْمِ فَمَنْ أَخَذَهُ أَخَذَهَا بِحَظٍ وَافِرٍ 
He said, those circles of knowledge that you see, it is the inheritance of the prophet. Because prophets don't leave behind dinar and dirham. They don't leave behind currency. They don't leave behind money to be inherited. They leave behind knowledge. They leave behind the ilm. And whoever gets that knowledge, whoever takes that knowledge, has taken a portion of the prophethood. This knowledge that we have of the religion. So seeking knowledge in the masjid. In the masjid, this was one of the main components by which their community was built upon. The masjid was also a place of refuge, even for those who had marital problems, <coughs> including the Prophet Sallallahu who boycotted his wives and stayed in the masjid for the duration of the time that he boycotted his wives. On another instance, and in another in, uh, another uh, another occasion, the Prophet Sallallahu went to the house of his daughter Fatima, and he asked, where was Ali? And Fatima, she said, that there was some issues between me and Ali. And it shows us that even though Fatima, one of the best of the women in paradise, even they had marital problems. So it doesn't mean that because you are religious or because you think you are a spiritual person that you are not going to have marital problems. Everybody has marital problems. They're universal across the board and it doesn't matter how much money you have, how intelligent you think you are, or how religious you believe you are. Everybody has marital problems. She, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam asked her, where's Ali? Where's your cousin? She said that there was between me and him some, some issues and he left. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam sent someone to go find where Ali was. Where did they find him? Did they find him in a bar drinking because he wanted to get some stress off of his chest? They found him in the masjid. Where was he at? He was in the masjid. We have marital problems. We can't use the stress and the problems that come to us in our lives as a justification for us to go out and commit haram. You run into Muslims all the time and it's like, well, I'm, you know, I'm going through something right now. We are going through something. Who's not going through something? dunya. Is the dunya anything else but trials and tribulations? Everybody is going through something. But do we use that I'm going through something as a justification to go out and to drink and to party and to, you know, lose our, our, our scruples? Because we're going through something. Or does the deen provide us with remedies for those Issue played a significant role in the development of the community uh, socially, the social development of the community. And it wasn't just a place to pray, which many messages have been reduced to today. The other component, the third component that was key in building the masjid of the, or building the community of the Prophet ﷺ was the camaraderie between the believers, the brotherhood between the believers. And this was something that the Prophet ﷺ emphasized and he understood. Because the Prophet ﷺ was a sheep herder. He said, <laughs> That there was no prophet except that he was a sheep herder. He used to tend to sheep. And some of the scholars, they explain why. Because sheep are the most difficult animals to get to cooperate with one another. Look at the fatty, the benefit in this. That sheep are the, the most uncooperative animals in the animal world. And so as a result of that, every prophet was a sheep herder. And this prepared him to deal with the, the tribal warfare that he had to deal with when he became a prophet. He literally had to take warring fractions and unite them together. And of course this was by the permission of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But it was the brotherhood. And cooperation, as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, وَتَعَاوَنُوا عَلَى الْبِرِّ وَالتَّقْوَى وَلَا تَعَاوَنُوا عَلَى الْإِثْمِ وَالْعُدْوَانِ And cooperate with one another upon righteousness and, 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 and piety. And do not cooperate with one another upon sin and transgression. The first thing that the Prophet ﷺ did when he entered into Medina, he began to pair the Muhajireen and the Ansar. He began to pair them together. He paired them together based upon their characters and based upon what they each needed from one another. The Prophet Sallallahu he paired Hamza with Zayd ibn Haritha. He, put, he, he uh, paired up uh, 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 Mu'ad ibn Jabal with Abdullah ibn Mas'ud. He paired Mus'ab ibn Umair with Abu Ayyub al-Ansari. He paired, he paired up Ammar ibn Yasir with Thabit ibn Qais. He paired Umar عنه, with Utban ibn Malik. He paired Abu Bakr with Kharija ibn Zayd. And he paired himself وسلم, with his younger cousin Ali ibn Abi Talib. 
He began to pair you and you, your brothers. You and you, your brothers. You and you, your brothers. So much so that one of the two, two of the, the one of the two that he paired together, Abdurrahman ibn Awf and Sa'id ibn Rabia, both of whom were the wealthiest individuals from the Muhajireen and the Ansar. Abdurrahman ibn Awf was one of the wealthiest companions in Mecca. He left everything to migrate to be with the Prophet in Medina. Sa'ad ibn Rabia, he was one of the wealthiest men from the Ansar, and the Prophet وسلم, paired them together. Sa'ad ibn Rabia, he said to Abdurrahman, Inni unasifuka nisfa mali, khud nisfa mali. He said that I will give you half of my wealth. Half of everything that I own is yours. Take it. He said, wa tahti imra'atain. He said, and I have two wives under me. He said, let me know. He said, look at both of them, and whichever one you like the most, I will divorce her. When she finishes her menses, her in, her in the period, you can marry her. SubhanAllah, This is the extent. This is more than, this is in addition to the brotherhood of Islam. So I will give you half of my wealth. Abdurrahman ibn Awf, he said to him, Barakallahu laka fi malika wa ahlika dunni ala suq. Abdurrahman ibn Awf, he said to Sa'ad, he said, may Allah bless you in your wealth and in your family. He said, just show me where the marketplace is. I can make my own money. Just show me what integrity. Sometimes when people offer you something, sometimes it's okay to say no. I'll do it myself. Sometimes it's okay to have that integrity. That is what our deen encourages us. Sometimes we feel as Muslims that we are entitled because I'm Muslim. You're entitled first and foremost to put your trust in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala first. And then you are entitled to the dignity that Islam gives you as a man. I'm not asking anybody for anything. And of course, if dire necessity comes about, then of course you have to do what you have to do. But he said to him, I don't want your wealth nor your wife. Just show me where the marketplace is and I can make my own money. And this is the, the integrity that Islam instills within us as believers. And we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to instill in us this integrity. For indeed Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, وَلِيُّ ذَلِكَ وَقَادِرٌ عَلَى كُلِّ شَيْءٍ بارك الله لي ولكم في القرآن العظيم ونفعني وإياكم بما جاء فيه من الآيات والذكر الحكيم أكل ما تسمعون أستغفر الله لي ولكم ولسائر المؤمنين من كل ذنب فاستغفروه إنه هو الغفور الرحيم الحمد لله حمدا كثيرا طيبا مباركا فيه كما يحب ربنا ويرضى وصلى الله على نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم تسليما كثيرا. The Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم didn't leave the brotherhood of Islam like that. He would reinforce this with statements like he said in the Hadith: "والذي نفسي بيدي لا تدخلون الجنة لا تدخلون الجنة حتى تؤمنوا ولا تؤمنون حتى تحابوا ألا أدلكم على أمر إذا فعلتموه the Prophet said, I swear by the one in whose hands my soul is in, none of you will enter into paradise until you believe. None of you will enter into paradise until you believe. And none of you will truly believe until you love one another. Can I not direct you to something that if you do it, it will create love between you, spread the salams between you. And wallah al-adheem, wallahi tallahi billahi, today it is difficult for us to even give the salam to one another. Wallah al just the salam, just the word salamu alaykum. And salamu alaykum, you get 10 hasanat just for saying assalamu alaykum. Wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. 30 barakat. 30 hasanat. Just for giving the salam to your brother, Wallah al Sometimes we get out the car, we pass on one another, we don't even give the salams. We're that busy, that disgruntled and dissatisfied with life that you can't even wish peace on your brother. The issue is, is that our understanding of love is, is very superficial, very elementary. Even the Prophet said he would tell his companions, I love you. He would say that on a regular basis. Can you imagine some of us, we don't even tell we, we don't even tell our children we love them. 
Some of us grew up in homes nobody ever told us we loved you. Especially when you grow up in harsh environments, and it doesn't matter where you are. Sometimes we tend to look at, you know, indigenous Americans as, you know, we grew up in ghettos and other places. Even in other areas of the world, you have the, there's a ghetto everywhere you go. I don't care where you go. There's ghettos everywhere you go. And in those type of hostile environments, a lot of times you don't find love there. It's love, but it's in a different way. It's a very harsh form of love. The Prophet was kissing his grandsons, Hassan and Hussein. And one of the companions who was a Bedouin, Bedouin, Akhra ibn Habis, he looked at the Prophet and he said, He said to the Prophet, Do you kiss the boys? The Prophet said, No. Yes, we kiss the boys. He said, Wallahi inna li asha min al awlad wa ma qabbaltu minhum ahadan. Abadan. He said, I have ten sons. I've never kissed any of them. The Prophet said, Well, what am I to do if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has removed rahmah, mercy from your heart? What do you want me to do? In another narration, he said, Man la yarham, la yurham. He who does not show mercy to people will not be shown mercy. Just as you do to people, it will be done to you. You, How do you not show mercy? And subhanAllah, as Muslims, we'll raise our hands to the sky and we'll ask Allah for all types of forgiveness and pardon and mercy and if we don't have mercy on one another. How dare you? How do you fundamentally ask Allah for mercy but then you don't have mercy on other people? How? Husband don't have mercy on his wife. Wife doesn't have mercy upon her husband. But yet still both of you raise your hands to the heavens and ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for his mercy. Ya Rahman, Ya Rahim, Ibn But then you turn around and you are a tyrant towards other people. My this, this does it doesn't work like that. He who does not show mercy, you will not be shown mercy. The Prophet said, Irham man fil ard, yarhamukum man fil sama. Be merciful to those who are on the earth, and the one that is above the heavens will be merciful to you. Be merciful to those that are on the earth, and the one that is above the heavens will be merciful to you. These are the components, the internal components, by which the Prophet established his community. And if we want salvation, if we want islah, if we want rectification of our communities, we have to follow the same blueprint. His community was a blueprint. If we follow that blueprint to the T, we will have the same success that they had. As Imam Malik rahimahullah ta'ala, he said, لا يصلح آخر هذه الأمة إلا بما أصلح أولها That the latter part of this ummah will not be rectified except by what rectified its former part. The same blueprint followed the same script and will get the same benefit. And there were many other components that the Prophet ﷺ used to build this community. And it's our responsibility to look into his seerah, look into his biography, look into his life, and to construct our communities with the same, uh, following the same blueprint. And brothers and sisters, I want to take time out to advise myself as well as the believers to establish the salah. Establish the salat in the masjid. The masjid is supposed to be packed with the believers, not just on Jumu'ah, not just on the Eid. For every salat, the, the salat is an obligation on the believers, the men in the masjid. And when Allah in the masjid, the salat is here, established five times a day. There is a resident imam here. This is a masjid, an official masjid. So if you live in the area and it doesn't take much out of you to get to the masjid to pray, come to the masjid and pray. The Prophet ﷺ said praying in jama'ah is worth 25 to 27 more barakah than praying by yourself. Not only that, when you pray by yourself, you have this laziness, many of us, this laziness with us. When we pray in jama'ah in congregation with everybody else, your spirits are lifted the moment you walk into the masjid and you see believers and you stand in the salah. You, you, you're invigorated when you see your brothers, which is why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made salat an obligation in congregation. This religion, what we practice in the deen is a communal religion, it's not an individual religion. That we go off to the corner and we, we get married by ourselves, we pray salat by ourselves, we fast by ourselves. No, we make hajj together. 
You don't make hajj by yourself. You make hajj with the rest of the believers. When we fast, we fast together. When we pray, we pray together. We do everything together as a community. Islam is a communal religion considering al-insan madaniyum bi qabari that the human being is a communal creature by nature. And so the deen is consistent with our fitrah, with our natural makeup, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best. ربنا آتنا في الدنيا حسنة وفي الآخرة حسنة وقنا عذاب النار اللهم إنا نسألك الهدى والتقى والفاف والغنى ربنا آتنا في الدنيا حسنة وفي الآخرة حسنة وقنا عذاب النار اللهم إنا نسألك الجنة وما قرب إليها من قول أو عمل ونعوذ بك من النار وما قرب إليها من قول أو عمل اللهم إنا نعوذ برضاك من صختك وبمعافاتك من عقوبتك وبك منك لا نحسدنا أنا عليك ولو حرصنا أنت كما أثنيت على نفسك وصل اللهم على النبي محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين وآخر دعوانا أن الحمد لله رب العالمين وأعطنا الصلاة